Let me see. Good morning. <laughs> this is Raymond Richard Neutra, uh, who's recording again, <laughs> or really recording this time, <laughs> for the Neutra Institute for Survival Through Design. And we're in conversation with filmmaker Titus Leber in Vienna, uh, who is a young high school student, met uh, Diona and Richard Neutra when they were on their sojourn in, uh, uh, at the end of their lives in Vienna. And uh, um, I'd like to start out with how that young student uh, progressed to become a, a filmmaker. Yeah, well, actually, uh, when I met your uh, parents, uh, Richard and Dione, which was in the late uh, 60s, I was still uh, at school in Vienna, but uh, my dream was already kind of uh, uh, fixed for fixed for for years to become a filmmaker, movie director, and as a matter of fact, the encounter with Dione from that time, ten years later, would lead to me coming to America, be her house guest for a year, and spend a year in Hollywood at AFI, where I was a, a student for directing in the directing class. But well, at that time uh, when I met him, I was still at school. And my career evolved in a, a strange way. As I said, I, uh, I did my, my year in Hollywood and made then maybe one of the wrongest decisions in my life because I was offered to stay in Hollywood and uh, my teachers were quite uh, happy with my progress. Uh, and they offered me to do a second year in AFI. But in Europe, I had uh, the offer to make my first real big feature film. And so I decided to come back to, to Europe, do my first feature film in 1980. It was called Anima the Fantastic Symphony. Uh, it made it to the Cannes Festival. So I started a good film career. But then uh, it didn't go on for whatever reason. Um, probably the main reason was that I was very uh, ambitious with my next project, which was supposed to become the glass bead game, Herman Hesse's famous Nobel Prize winning novel, Magister Ludi, which I wanted to turn into a movie. And which at that time in the 80s was just a number too big for Europe and a number too small for America. So I wound up essentially between old chairs. I couldn't, didn't get to make the film. However, uh, when I did the uh, location hunting for the film, I stopped in MIT because I thought I would maybe find the glass bead players, uh, the people I wanted to cast for my film in MIT. And at MIT, they saw my first movie and my second movie. And they said, well, why don't you come here and spend a year at MIT as a research fellow? And that brought about a radical, a radical change in my career because uh, that was 1984, which was basically year one of multimedia, interactive media, touchscreen and stuff like that. The time, I mean, that was before the internet, that was before uh, DVD, CD-ROM, so it was still analog, uh, laser disc media. And from there, I went back to Europe uh, thinking that it would be nice to bring uh, uh, together best of both worlds, high tech from America and cultural heritage from uh, Europe. And to make the long story short, I think that uh, was the way I followed for the next uh, few decades uh, as a kind of pioneering multimedia uh, for its use in cultural heritage transmission. I was then invited uh, to Paris. I worked for the Louvre. I worked with IBM on a project I proposed to them to make the history of Europe interactive. And then in another turn uh, of uh, destiny, which would be too long to go into details into it, I got called to Thailand uh, to do a large Buddha, uh, project on the life and teaching of Lord Buddha, an interactive project. And that essentially left us for the last 20 years in Southeast Asia, doing very, very large scale multimedia and interactive projects on Buddhism, first in Thailand and in Indonesia. And well, since five years, I'm back in, in Vienna and I'm now on my most ambitious project so far that is to, to put 
Africa's cultural history to bring that to cyberspace. If it will work, I don't know. I'm in the middle of it. Well, so far as a brief introduction, but let me go back to the late 60s when I, I had the, the chance, the privilege of meeting your parents. Uh, I met them through Emmy Fuchs. She was a publisher here in Vienna, which was a good friend. She was a good friend of mine. Uh, of my mother. And uh, I guess th those were, if I uh, reconstructed uh, correctly, just the years when uh, Richard and Tione tried to come back to Vienna to reestablish themselves uh, in Vienna. I, I believe the house in Silver Lake had burned in 63. And uh, I'm not uh, exactly f familiar with the motives uh, which brought uh, them back here. But as I understood from uh, the correspondence I was just rereading and studying, uh, there were ambitions and hopes, uh, let's put it this way, uh, that Vienna could become kind of a center, at least for this part of the world, to propagate Richard's ideas. And as a matter of fact, my father, Hermann Leber, uh, became the director and secretary general of uh, the Richard Mitra Institute here. Um, with wonderful ambitions, I just read my, my father designed a 16 point program of what uh, all the plans, what was supposed to happen here uh, and to be made, uh, among others, an Olympics, an ar architectural Olympics, a media center, an international PR center for the uh, sorts of Richard to be propagated from here into the entire world. I believe this uh, film you mentioned before uh, was made in this period. I don't know who made it, who directed it, because uh, those were uh, 68, 69 were the two years where I uh, did not really follow what happened in the professional life of my father, because it was my graduation year. And then I spent 69 at the army. So I was not much in touch with Richard and Dione, and even with my father, because uh, again, I mean, it was graduation and military uh, time. However, I have two wonderful, uh, rec very important recollections for two meetings I had uh, with Richard and uh, Dione, and which became in some way pivotal in my in my life. Yeah rather intimate de details, but I want to share them with you. The first uh, uh, meeting, we, we we had the chance to spend several years in a row, at least two times in a row, uh, Easter together. And the first time, it was in the house of Amy Fuchs, uh, the publisher. She had a house outside of Vienna, a uh, country house, and we spent Easter there. And I remember uh, I, I believe Richard was at that uh, time, 74 or 75 or uh, around that time. And I remember uh, on one Easter uh, Monday, I believe it was, I, I entered the house and a door was closed and I pushed this door open, uh, but I was not able to push it open completely. So apparently somebody was behind the door. And when I came in, I saw these old, two old people tenderly and passionately embracing each other. And I said, my God, this is so wonderful. Uh, these people of 75, uh, I mean, Dione was a little bit younger. And that made a very, very deep impression on me because I, 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 that was really such a fundamental and profound expression of love. And that stayed with me. That was the first uh, memory I, I had uh, of the two of them. And then I believe it was in 69, uh, Dion and Richard came to us. We, we had a, a, a holiday place in the mountains in Austria, in Zellamsee. Uh, that's the place where I was born. That's an hour from Salzburg. And uh, on, on one of these uh, few days when they spent with me, it was very clear and still frosty. Uh, winter night, beginning of April, and uh, Richard, whom whom admired without really being able to appreciate at that time, really uh, the, the scope and the 
immensity of what, what he contributed to the world. But I mean, from the few things I heard from him, it was a man who, whom I tremendously admired. And uh, I hate to say it, from whom I always had the feeling that I would have been, uh, would have loved he was my father <laughs> instead of my own father, <laughs> because I, I saw in, in him such a Renaissance man. And uh, uh, I had at that time big troubles with my father, big frictions. And I always said, I wish my father was an enlightened person like, like, like Richard. And one evening, this uh, this particular evening, we had a, I had a chance, we had a chance to work together, to walk together uh, through this cold, starry night. And he said a phrase which was another marking point in my uh, uh, life because I said I expressed some, I think I expressed to him somehow uh, my admiration for him. And he said, you know, Titus, in a man's life, uh, there are moments when one feels so strong that one can think about uh, even building a thousand years empire ahead and, and pharaonic empires. And there are other moments where one feels so weak that one doesn't even uh, know if one can reach the next chair, which is a meter away from you. And I find that uh, I found that so humble and I was so impressed. And this very phrase gave me always strength in my life, always when, uh, obviously not in the moments when I was very strong, but in the moments when I felt weak, I always thought of Richard that night. And I said, man, even a, a guy like Richard, uh, who was so, such a hero of mine, and he, he must have had these weak moments and uh, he didn't know how, how to reach the next chair. And that, uh, yeah, it really always gave me a lot of comfort and strength. Uh, now, that is as much as I recall from the Vienna time. I realize, I mean, uh, in preparation of our meeting today, I've been uh, going through a number of documents which, uh, curiously enough, only reached uh, my hands very recently uh, on rather mysterious ways because they had wound up in the hand of a rather obscure uh, antique dealer who apparently, well, I don't want to go into details. Apparently my mother had authorized him uh, when he helped her moving, uh, get whatever he liked and his eyes must have focused on on this Neutra uh, correspondence between my father and him. And he tried to sell them on the market. And for some reason, he suddenly came to me and said, well, here, here is, I think uh, I have a nice thing for you. And he gave me all these documents back and I studied them for a meeting today in preparation of our meeting. And I believe and I understand and I suppose uh, a, lo uh, a large number of these documents you uh, must be in your possession anyway in, in the originals because I have mostly copies. I believe this last three years here in Vienna between 67 and 69 must have been very disappointing and very frustrating uh, for, for, for Richard because uh, I think he came with very high hopes and I found a letter from Dione where in 67 she had uh, 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 already uh, planned herself and, and said how in your mind this, uh, this Austrian uh, Neutra Institute, uh, what it could do and what it should become. And there's a very interesting quotation because uh, she said one of the, uh, uh, of the, of the uh, goals of this school, of this uh, uh, institute here should be to teach young people uh, uh, to wait, wait, where are we? Um, uh, to avoid, yeah, to avoid the visual dangers of the surrounding, uh, of, of, of the surrounding of the world around us. And I was wondering what she meant by that, these visual dangers, yeah. Uh, later in that letter, I, I, I think uh, some people must have attacked uh, for some whatever reason, uh, Richard, uh, probably very conventional people who couldn't, couldn't follow what he was doing. But this term of uh, visual danger around us 
is something which may have contributed uh, to this profound harmony between uh, Dion and me, because uh, this is uh, curiously something which I came up with a few years ago in the European Cultural Parliament, uh, that I said we uh, must create uh, uh, a place where we not only uh, deal with pollution in the outer world, but with pollution in the mind, with the mind pollution, which is the same thing, visual dangers. I mean, I applied it obviously in a different manner because I believe that a lot of these problems America has at the moment with the mass shootings and so comes from the mental pollution from video games and too much violence in the media and so. But we use the same term, yeah, visual danger, yeah. And well, anyway, I believe that uh, unfortunately, this Viennese way uh, years uh, and whatever had happened with this movie, I didn't uh, get too much to understand what the problem with the with this movie was. But I believe uh, some distribution problems or a translation, uh, probably distribution problems. And I must say, uh, by my own rather bitter experience, I'm unfortunately not surprised what happened to, to Richard uh, here in Vienna and Richard and Dione because Vienna is a, is a very mean town. It's a beautiful town, but the people and the mentality is one probably one of the worst in the world there yeah, because it's a town which creates a lot of expectations. And uh, in Asia, we would say uh, a very sweet mouth. They promise you everything and to deceive you and to stab you in the back. And it's it's a miserable place for anybody creative. Unfortunately, I hate to say it, I mean, it's my own town, but uh, we have a saying in Vienna, which goes, if you want to be successful in Vienna, uh, um, the best thing you can do is die because 30 years after your death, you will be recognized there. Yeah. And it happened <laughs> to all our great musicians. I mean, we're talking about Mozart, we are, uh, talk about Mahler, we talk about Schubert. I mean, all these people died essentially pretty miserably and were recognized only decades after they passed away. And I think, unfortunately, uh, Richard must have uh, gotten a, a, a full load of, of uh, uh, this mean mentality where he was promised God knows what, and I can see what ambitious plans my father had formed for him and how much he learned, how much uh, thing, but beyond giving him uh, an honorary ring, which he did with me also recently, they made me a professor, but besides that, they let you die. <laughs> they don't do anything. And I think it was essentially a very, very wise decision of Richard and uh, they wanted to go back uh, to California because there they were treated wonderfully and that is wonderful house and that brings me essentially to the to the second part of my uh, relation which was uh, uh, obviously then only uh, with the owner because uh, uh, Richard by the time I came to the first time to America unfortunately was not among us anymore and I believe this must have been in uh, the beginning uh, of the of the uh, no it was not sorry it was not the first time it was the next time I came back to America that was in the beginning of the 80s sorry no 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 sorry sorry I mixed it up uh, I came the first time uh, to the United States in the beginning uh, in the mid 70s sorry I got that mixed up yeah um, in the in the uh, early 70s, I came with uh, Emmy Fuchs, with the publisher, uh, to to America, and we spent only a few days in LA. And at that time, I had rented a car, and uh, I drove by pure accident uh, into the grounds of AFI, American Film Institute, which which was at that time still in Greystone Mansion uh, of Sunset Boulevard. And I saw this place and I saw it's a film school and I saw it's run by Charlton Hest. And I said, my God, this, this would be a dream to be here. And in the evening when I came home and I told Dione uh, about this discovery, she said, well, 
you know, I'd like uh, to give you the opportunity if you can make it to be accepted in the school. Uh, I will give you shelter. Uh, you can stay with me here and you will be my house guest. And without her, I, I never could do that. That's why I applied uh, to American Film Institute. I had done my first short film at that time in Europe and I got chosen among 600 foreign students. They took only 10. And I was one of these 10 fortunate uh, uh, students to, to spend a year. And Charlton Heston wrote me his personal letter of welcome. And that was the uh, nine or 10 months when I spent for the first time uh, time with uh, Dione. And I remember it was so wonderful. She gave me a very precise daily schedule. She said, uh, we will have breakfast together. I, Dione, I will fix uh, a grapefruit for you and a sandwich. And for the rest of the day, you're independent on your own and uh, you do whatever you have to do. And uh, to make you start earlier, here's a check of $1,000 so you can you buy yourself a car. And uh, I bought a Cougar, a hot rod at the time. And there I was on my, on myself and, and started uh, my, uh, my, my, uh, my school at AFI, which was very demanding. I didn't see that much of her because this AFI, they kept you really full time, uh, 20 hours a day or 16 hours a day. Uh, and in the evening you had always screening. So I saw her mostly on weekends. And I remember these wonderful times we spent up there in the penthouse of, of the Silver Lake house, which was my favorite room ever in my life with its four glass walls. And as I told you before, I mean, I'm a Pisces, I love the water. And when you kind of uh, sat uh, with your back low, I mean, you, you and that was, I believe, uh, Richard's idea, you could see the surface of the water from the Silver Lake House uh, go straight into perspective of the Silver Lake Reservoir Lake. And I could spend hours and hours up there just uh, enjoying myself in this light flooded house, which was, again, a very important uh, experience for me because in Vienna uh, we lived in a wonderful place but uh, unfortunately a very very dark place I mean we uh, lived my father when he came in the 50s to Vienna uh, got a job as a publisher in the Palais Esterhazy which is one of the old palaces right in the center of Vienna I mean it, it is in in the heart of the heart of the city and our apartment was uh, actually constituted by the rooms where Haydn, the composer Haydn, had his rooms. He was the whole court composer for uh, the Esther houses. And the publishing uh, house was in the first court. We were in the second court. And well, as employees, I guess, in the 18th, 17th, 18th century, uh, they lived in rooms which were had little windows out. Uh, they were bloody dark in there, and I called it always the cave. And I got, uh, yeah, fully depressive in there. And when I was then given the chance to live in the Silver Lake house and uh, to in this flood, uh, uh, light flooded uh, rooms, as I say, the uh, uh, the penthouse became for me, uh, yeah, the, uh, the epitome of how one could live happily and. When I was lucky, uh, Dione would come up there and play the cello, and I would uh, listen to uh, her playing the cello and sing her Swiss songs, and then I would tell her from school, and it was a very happy year, I must say, a uh, very, very happy year. And then, as I say, maybe I did a big error going back to Europe, uh, trying to make my film career here, which didn't become a film career. And I guess in the in the years around 83, I uh, came back, I must have come back, I'm trying to put the timeline together to uh, Los Angeles. And that was uh, the next key, key uh, thing uh, Dione gave me on, on my way of life, because at that time, 
already at Los at AFI. I had met uh, Janine, my future wife, but at that time it was uh, she was still married to somebody else. And I mean, for the first four years or five years, it seemed even impossible to ever get together. But I wrote a film for her and uh, that was another project uh, uh, after the Glass Speed Game uh, project, which played in, in Death Valley and uh, which I'd essentially written to give her a role. And I met her again in these years. And well, we started to realize that we were made for each other. And uh, uh, Janina had an apartment. And so I started to live partly in our apartment still with the other food I lived in, in Silver Lake. And I remember uh, going to Dione for advice. I said, uh, look, uh, Jenny is uh, a few years older than me. And uh, I came to Dion for her advice. And I said, what is the secret of your love? I mean, I, I saw you, uh, you had such a fantastic uh, loving relationship with Richard. And now it seems to, to become serious in my life. And if I have to give to uh, Janina, my wife, uh, my future wife, an advice of how you made it to be so happy with Richard, what was, what would it be? And she coined this one phrase, which again then stayed for me for the rest of with us, uh, uh, for the rest of our life, which was um, uh, love is to help the person with whom you live uh, accomplish. Uh, fulfill his full potential and that's how what our relation became yeah uh, and then Janina has really followed in the steps of the only whom I, I really considered as my second mother yeah I always called the only my second mom and uh, my wife followed in in the advice in the footsteps of this advice and she always helped me in my life to fulfill my potential and did her possible and we had a very happy life and I'm glad to say that now that we are uh, in our 70s uh, that we have I think an as happy a relation as Dione and Richard had and I think I owe really a lot to Dione and Richard that my private life could become so happy and enlightened uh, yeah so so much for my <laughs> personal uh, uh, meetings and and relation with them. Um, at some point, uh, you made a film with Dion and Diona about the house, which we have on our website, um, where Dion is wandering through the house, and you can hear Diona playing the cello, a Bach suite, in in the back. Do you remember it? Very vaguely, I must say. Uh, was it black? I, I suppose it was black and white. No, was it was it? in color. Uh -huh. Oh, then it must have been with my own camera because at AFI uh, we had uh, only only black and white equipment, and it must have been a Super 8 film, I suppose. Then, and yeah, uh, I remember that I, I shot material. That part I remember because I remember also the reflections and so, but I, I'm i not sure, did I complete it? I don't think it was the Yeah, film. you did, there was a title. Um, if you go to www.neutra.org and then to, uh, I think it's under about the Neutras and it's Experience Neutra, there's a, uh, um, that film is is there. Yeah. Uh, really? Yeah, then. Uh, okay, I. you make me curious now. <laughs> uh, okay, Nitra Institute, and where would I go? Uh, I think look under about... Under, I go directly to Nitra Institute for Survival, yeah? Um, I think it is under or the museum. N no, not not the museum. You go to um, um, no. it, it says experience Neutra. It's under a sub page. I think 
it, it's under about the Neutros. Neutro Institute, uh, board member. Hmm. Well, I I don't. Oh yeah, about about Neutra. Yeah. Okay. Is there something about experience? Experience, experience, experience Neutra. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Mm. This little yeah. Seven minutes. Uh huh. Yeah, amazing. Oh, this is wonderful. Ah, I know, you know, I don't have a copy. That's why I forgot about this film. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I won't look at the whole thing now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice surprise for my own filmography. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, but there was no no interview, I think. Uh, it was just the impressions. Uh, we hear the music and we see Dion and Nitra. Okay. <laughs> I, I scrolled through it very rapidly now, yeah. Right. Uh, tell me a little bit about your father and how it came and uh, and what you remember about this these 16 points of of what they wanted to achieve there well i have them uh, in front of me here um and uh if if i summarize it i think uh there's a number of points which uh were essentially uh related to creating archives and pr uh, facilities there and uh, I think the, the archival points are, are broken down into several points, a slide archive and an uh, art, uh, archive about all the articles uh, which appeared in uh, whatever materials, yeah. And there was a, a, a press uh, office uh, which was in charge, uh, supposed to be in charge to send out articles uh, all over the pl place. A, uh, image archive, which was supposed to collect every every uh, document, which would uh, not only be of Richard things, but of buildings which would go essentially in the direction of a document, uh, things which would go in the direction of his ideas. Um, there was a sound archive uh, for for uh, uh, records and for tapes. Uh, I suppose with all the speeches of um, Richard during symposiums and things like that, uh, then the Institute was supposed to make uh, moving uh, uh, exhibitions with models, which should go to school and universities and organizations. There was a strong uh, accent on interdis interdisciplinary uh, exchange about uh, the evolution of human biological uh, advance. Um, uh, then there was supposed uh, to be a quarterly uh, report, um, which was to be sent to 900 uh, addresses uh, expected to grow and uh, to, to uh, bring out the whole thing over Radio, TV played an important role uh, on the light. Yeah, and then comes the big thing of this Congress, uh, which apparently, I, I don't know, uh, I suppose it was your father's idea, but it, it, it's, it appears here in my father's writing that every five years, I, I guess the idea was uh, that Vienna gave to your father uh, an, a ring of honor like the Ifland ring. The Ifland uh, ring is something among, among actors. It's uh, in recognition of a uh, particular, uh, uh, it's kind of lifetime award uh, you get. And it's uh, not supposed to remain in the possession of the family uh, of the actor who gets it, but it's passed on to somebody who is, uh, has enough merits to be the carrier of the ring. And, 
I think the idea of uh, this competition was to create every five years some kind of an international uh, conference competition in which uh, uh, a jury of the, of the best architects in the world would uh, convene, choose a project, and then pass on this ring which Richard got from the city of Vienna to the next uh, uh, winner of the competition. And the idea was to pass it on and on and on, yeah. But again, I suppose you have this, uh, this uh, listing of my father. It's all in German. I don't know if these things have ever been translated. Uh, but I mean, I have only copies here, so I assume that the, the originals must be in the archive, in, in, in your archive. And uh, uh, what, what else was there? Uh, uh, yeah, it was supposed to be a, uh, a media take where people could, li uh, could, could uh, borrow uh, films and uh, for schools and uh, where skill, uh, schools could borrow films uh, which are made about uh, your father's ideas and, and projects and so on. Uh, then uh, there was a big PR aspect to create contact uh, with uh, TV stations all over the world. This was supposed to be coordinated from here. And uh, then execution of special things uh, like uh, speeches and presentations and uh, cycles of, uh, of presentations. Uh, then uh, uh, an architectural library uh, in general and uh, where people could uh, inform themselves about library, uh, about architecture. Uh, even a bookshop was supposed uh, to be created, dedicated especially uh, to books. And then active uh, preparation of this uh, five years uh, uh, Olympics. That's a little bit repetitive. Then the creation of a Richard uh, Neutra medal, uh, which would go along with uh, passing on the ring. And uh, probably and and uh, support the publication of books and uh, pocket books uh, in different languages. I guess a big role in this whole thing played the Amandus for like of Amy Fuchs, whom I mentioned before. So I think she was an uh, essential element. My father was a publisher, she was a publisher, and I think uh, Amy's role, well, my father was more in. In, in, in novels and things like that. But Emmy's publishing house was very specialized. I mean, she also published the, the works of Marilyn Williams, uh, uh, who, who has this Williams school in Texas. And, and so she uh, was very much into this ecological and ecological uh, ecolo ecology of the mind things. And uh, she was supposed to, to play, I think, a very crucial role and if I understand it right, one of the goals in this whole uh, thing was to provide your parents with an appropriate place here in Vienna. And that's what apparently never happened, yeah? And as far as I can see, uh, it was intervened and uh, even the, the prime minister received uh, Richard and um, there were large committees to support this whole thing. This was probably organized all by my father. And for some reason, it never happened. And as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised that, uh, I mean, I am surprised because, because somebody of the caliber of, of Richard, uh, you cannot understand why it didn't happen. But knowing the mentality, knowing the bureaucracy here, uh, it's just so typical, I hate to say it, yeah. and that's probably what, what uh, happened. I mean, I, as I say, I mean, at that time, I was too young to be involved and, and all that that is for me. I'm discovering this uh, as I'm reading it now and as I'm getting into it. But uh, these were the plans of my father. So the, uh, it's all together 16 points yeah, in this program, uh, which he had formulated. And I can see the there was a very intense uh, uh, correspondence between your father, my father, 
I found a very moving letter, a personal letter from the owner, a handwritten letter to uh, my parents, uh, which was written just a few days after the death of your father, where she thanked uh, them for everything they did. And I guess knowing my father, he tried as hard as he could uh, to, to get this thing uh, moving here. But I know, I mean, even my father had a very difficult time in his last years here in Vienna. So it's the nature of the beast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. I think the um, uh, having been the having been the site of the Habsburg Empire, that the um, Viennese have this sense of uh, of uh, and because the empire was multicultural, uh, that it uh, that there is this sense of grandeur and doing things in a big way. Uh, and it's fun to imagine them, but uh, then I guess there's all kinds of backbiting and politics oh, yeah. and, and, and things that uh, um, um, well, no, make I, it difficult I mean, to keep uh, it going. If, if you look at it psychoanalytically, it probably goes even deeper because, I mean, we, we had this huge empire, which then we were one, one of the largest empires in the world and then we became one of the smallest countries of the world and i think the the austrian mind never made it really uh really across uh, this loss and there is a, a bloody arrogance here which uh, uh you have to feed people the feeling that people here and the bureaucracy they consider themselves as the navel of the world and uh, 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 there's a saying here, anybody could come here and try uh, pretend that he is something important. But I mean, who is he? Uh -huh. yeah. and, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, and, and the other thing, I mean, one should probably not neglect, and I'm again talking of my own experience now. I mean, I find it incredibly difficult after having been away 20 years from here, to set foot again, yeah, because uh, people forget about you, they ignore you, and I keep asking people. I say, "Well, uh, come on! I mean, I I have all these records around the world and uh, uh, awards and everything." And the first thing is, uh, they ask me, "Do you have a party book? Do you belong to one of the two big parties?" Here? And when you don't uh, have a political affiliation in this country, you're dead. Uh, I mean. And, and they grow over a lifetime and they support each other. And it's very, very strong here. And I guess uh, Richard was probably as naive as I am uh, about, uh, he probably couldn't care less about any kind of political affiliation. And uh, once you're not in these things, with whomever you deal, you will have on the other side a party which will try to torpedo what you're doing because it's done by the other party. So if he went, here to, to, to see the, the prime minister, there was probably already somebody from the other side torpedoing uh, what they were doing, not for, uh, because it was Richard, it just because it was made by the other party, you see. So uh -huh. that would be one of the explanations, uh, because that's very innate here, and especially in these years around um, uh, the uh the late uh, uh early 70s and in the 70s and 80s there was a strong divide between red and black uh between socialists li liberals and conservatives and they did everything they could to uh to torpedo each other and when you get between this uh, it's like grinding stones and uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter who, who you are or what you have done but you get between these grinding stones and that's it, yeah. yeah. Um, Interesting. I mean, Interesting. Yeah. Um, so uh, this last year, uh, since Dion's death, the uh, we have augmented our board with people with expertise in environmental psychology and in preservation and have been thinking a lot about now how to boil down the goal of what would be possible and we come with a mission that says that we preserve and use the Neutra legacy to promote creative research and designs that benefit 
people and the planet. Mm. And uh, so we're trying to find ways to use this legacy in a way that um, is helpful to people who are on a similar kind of agenda, which uh, my father would have been on. Um, and, and to the extent that these musings and ideas and practices are stimulating an ongoing discussion as opposed to simply imitating them, uh, mm. that would constitute success. So we have uh, two projects uh, now of, of people who have an agenda that, that uh, is in harmony with ours. One of them is related to your multimedia uh, thing is a interesting young man who is thinking of making a virtual capture of the VDL studio residence and then our avatars could meet in that place and talk to each other and move around this space instead of having little boxes on the screen. And um, the other project is the research arm of a big architectural firm who's interested in going back to the UCLA laboratory school. It was a, 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 uh, um, a primary school uh, with gardens and everything that still is operating at UCLA to see how it's functioning how, now 60 years later and how it could be modified to adapt to the increasingly hot climate of Los Angeles, which mm -hmm. is moving in the direction of being as hot as Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. So, wow. um, uh, I didn't know it was that bad, yeah. Uh, so anyway, that's what we're trying experiments to see what what might work. Well, um I, I was, uh, when I went through these papers in preparation of today, um, I was wondering, and I wanted actually to, to ask you the, the question, because that has uh, finally uh, just popped up uh, uh, last week uh, in a completely different context. Um, this idea I, I followed, but only on a, on a sidetrack in my life of an ecology of the mind, yeah? Uh, as I mentioned before, I mean, we are very concerned always about the uh, pollution, uh, uh, physically pollution around us. And and I was very, uh, and I gave a number of speeches about the, uh, how it seems to me as important to look at the uh, dangers of the pollution of the mind. And that's why I got so struck uh, by the honest word of the uh, of the uh, visual dangers around us. And so I was wondering how much uh, research in, in such a direction would have been along what you just mentioned now, the ideas of, of, of Richard uh, into uh, now the 21st century, uh, because obviously, I mean, I'm not into architecture, but I always felt uh, uh, very, as I said before, impressed and influenced by him, by, by his ecological thinking. And I had always uh, uh, felt endowed to him and, and grateful to him that he opened my eyes uh, to this, to this uh, uh, dangers of, uh, of inhumane uh, uh, environments. And as I say, I've uh, developed that in my own direction uh, being concerned about uh, the pollution of the mind. And I tried to to promote these ideas a few years ago at the European Parliament. I'm a member of the uh, European Cultural Par Parliament, I should say. And uh, I came up with an idea to uh, set up a tax for violence for people who uh, uh, propagate through media violence for the violent sake yeah? and I, I find this is one of the of the probably the main reasons why we have so much problems with mass shootings and and they almost kicked me out of the European Parliament of Culture yeah? they, they say you're crazy you want to censor people and you want to introduce censorship and I said well why don't we come up with a uh a, a, a Richter index you know the same thing we have for earthquakes uh, and and uh, I propose to design a method 
in which we could uh, tax a film on how much violence for the violence sake is in the film. Because I mean, uh, uh, you need sometimes uh, dramaturgically, like in the antique tragedies, I mean, violence is part of our life. But many people use violence just for the violence sake uh, to make a cheap buck. Yeah? And, and this is even uh, more true for video games and stuff like that. And so I was wondering how, how much something like that would fit in in the goals which you mentioned, uh, which you just mentioned, of of the research, or is that too too far away from what you're doing? I think it's a little bit. Um, I can see the relation, but I think it's a little bit um, off target. Um, but it's it's certainly clear that the wisdom traditions of of uh, all cultures have been aware of of what you put your mind to is uh, is uh, very powerful and i think you're absolutely right that um there are all kinds of um inherent um capabilities in human beings that can be evoked uh and uh we certainly have seen in in the, in the media and the news that the more outraged uh, on either side the people are, the more people uh, look at it. And of course, where you have you depend on advertising and you depend on this kind of thing, it it, it um, is a downward spiral. Mm. Well, Titus, thank you so much for <laughs> for these memories. Um, you have a unique perspective, uh, and you've told me some things that I didn't know. And uh, I look forward to our further conversations. Uh, is there a way I, I can retrieve the recording also? Or... Yes, I will. Uh, I will upload it to my drive, and then I will send you a, a link. Uh, okay. Okay, and the other thing I I have not forgotten about it. It was just uh, uh, very different with this lockdown. I'll mail you all this uh, convolute of papers. Uh, give me still a little bit time with this lockdown because, uh, as I say, it's very difficult to move. But I have not forgotten it, and I mean this should be all centralized, obviously. In, in the institute's hands, and, and I'll, I'll mail you this uh, it's, it's whole package of things here. Yeah. Okay, great. And I'm Thank sure you you will, it will be a treasure trove here. Yeah. Um, what, what about the German texts? I mean, is there anybody, I mean, you, you scan them and, and use Google Translate, or what, what do you do with the German uh, documents? Um, yeah, well, just having them. It, it, it's interesting. We, we're thinking about the audience for this, and uh, it's not like a regular website where you're trying to sell something and so you need to have lots of people. It's rather that uh, people who are thought leaders that find something interesting in this will find someone to translate, or there there are German scholars who who have access to these things so um i'm doing a lot now i mean i'm scanning in documents and have them just uh pass through google translate and i mean uh maybe that might be a way to uh to consider for you to do that uh i mean obviously they're all type of scripts uh, but i mean uh, with with uh uh, letter uh, type recognition today, or you can scan these things. Uh, maybe at UCLA they could do that, and that would be an interesting way to make this also more accessible. And I mean, I would be happy if the ideas which my father promoted at that time, if somehow uh, they would find the, uh, their continuation. I mean, this is multimedia archive. This. Uh, everything he had in his mind sounds wonderful what they had planned at the time yeah 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 excellent well if i can be of any help let me know and for the time being uh, thank you for this interview and yeah. thank, thank you for preparing for it and
<laughs> the sweet memories about my mother's generosity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she she was really uh she gave me a, life, a chance of a life really uh not only because of where i was at school there but because i, I met my wife in this uh, time in in los angeles <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah great okay, okay. all the best uh to everybody to your wife thank you and um, a big uh hug for you <laughs> and thank you okay uh, and greetings to, to greetings to janina that i haven't seen since 1980s <laughs> i will tell her thank you she sends also her warmest regards yeah okay okay bye-bye bye thank you